Chapter 18 The door was ajar. They entered. John. From the bathroom came an unpleasant and characteristic sound. Is there anything the matter? Helmholtz called. There was no answer. The unpleasant sound was repeated twice. There was silence. Then with a click the bathroom door opened and very pale the savage emerged. I say, Helmholtz exclaimed solicitously, you do look ill, John. Did you eat something that didn't agree with you? asked Bernard. The savage nodded. I ate civilization. What? It poisoned me. I was defiled. And then, he added in a lower tone, I ate my own wickedness. Yes, but what exactly? I mean, just now you were... Now I am purified, said the savage. I drank some mustard and warm water. The others stared at him in astonishment. Do you mean to say that you were doing it on purpose? asked Bernard. That's how the Indians always purify themselves. He sat down and sighing passed his hand across his forehead. I shall rest for a few minutes, he said. I'm rather tired. Well, I'm not surprised, said Helmholtz. After a silence, we've come to say goodbye, he went on in another tone. We're off tomorrow morning. Yes, we're off tomorrow, said Bernard, on whose face the savage remarked a new expression of determined resignation. And by the way, John, he continued, leaning forward in his chair and laying a hand on the savage's knee, I want to say how sorry I am about everything that happened yesterday. He blushed. How ashamed, he went on, in spite of the unsteadiness of his voice. How really... The savage cut him short and, taking his hand, affectionately pressed it. Helmholtz was wonderful to me, Bernard resumed, after a little pause. If it hadn't been for him, I should... Now, now, Helmholtz protested. There was a silence. In spite of their sadness, because of it even, for their sadness was the symptom of their love for one another, the three young men were happy. I went to see the controller this morning, said the savage at last. What for? To ask if I mightn't go to the islands with you. And what did he say? asked Helmholtz eagerly. The savage shook his head. He wouldn't let me. Why not? He said he wanted to go on with the experiment, but I'm damned, the savage added with sudden fury. I'm damned if I'll go on being experimented with, not for all the controllers in the world. I shall go away tomorrow too. But where? the others asked in unison. The savage shrugged his shoulders. Anywhere, I don't care, so long as I can be alone. From Guildford, the downline followed the Way Valley to Godalming, then over Milford and Whitley proceeded to Haslemere and on through Petersfield towards Portsmouth. Roughly parallel to it, the upline passed over Warplesden, Tongham, Puttenham, Elstead, and Greyshot. Between the Hog's Back and Hindhead, there were points where the two lines were not more than six or seven kilometers apart. The distance was too small for careless flyers, particularly at night and when they had taken half a gram too much. There had been accidents, serious ones. It had been decided to deflect the upline a few kilometers to the west. Between Greyshot and Tongham, four abandoned air lighthouses marked the course of the old Portsmouth to London road. The skies above them were silent and deserted. It was over Selborne, Borden, and Farnham that the helicopters now ceaselessly hummed and roared. The savage had chosen as his hermitage the old lighthouse which stood on the crest of the hill between Puttenham and Elstead. The building was of ferro-concrete and in excellent condition, almost too comfortable, the savage had thought when he first explored the place, almost too civilizedly luxurious. He pacified his conscience by promising himself a compensatingly harder self-discipline, purifications the more complete and thorough. His first night in the hermitage was, deliberately, a sleepless one. He spent the hours on his knees praying now to that heaven from which the guilty Claudius had begged forgiveness, now in Zuni to Awanawalona, now to Jesus and Pukong, now to his own guardian animal, the eagle. From time to time he stretched out his arms as though he were on the cross, and held them thus through long minutes of an ache that gradually increased till it became a tremulous and excruciating agony, held them in voluntary crucifixion while he repeated through clenched teeth, the sweat meanwhile pouring down his face, Oh, forgive me! Oh, make me pure! Oh, help me to be good! Again and again till he was on the point of fainting from the pain. When morning came, he felt he had earned the right to inhabit the lighthouse, yes, even though there still was glass in most of the windows, even though the view from the platform was so fine.
for the very reason why he had chosen the lighthouse had become almost instantly a reason for going somewhere else. He had decided to live there because the view was so beautiful, because from his vantage point, he seemed to be looking out onto the incarnation of a divine being. But who was he to be pampered with the daily and hourly sight of loveliness? Who was he to be living in the visible presence of God? All he deserved to live in was some filthy sty, some blind hole in the ground, stiff and still aching after his long night of pain, but for that very reason inwardly reassured, he climbed up to the platform of his tower. He looked out over the bright sunrise world which he had regained the right to inhabit. On the north the view was bounded by the long chalk ridge of the Hog's Back, from behind whose eastern extremity rose the towers of the seven skyscrapers which constituted Guildford. Seeing them, the savage made a grimace, but he was to become reconciled to them in course of time, for at night they twinkled gaily with geometrical constellations, or else floodlighted pointed their luminous fingers with a gesture whose significance nobody in England but the savage now understood, solemnly towards the plumless mysteries of heaven. In the valley which separated the hog's back from the sandy hill on which the lighthouse stood, Putnam was a modest little village nine stories high, with silos, a poultry farm, and a small vitamin D factory. On the other side of the lighthouse, towards the south, the ground fell away in long slopes of heather to a chain of ponds. Beyond them, above the intervening woods, rose the fourteen-story tower of Elstead. Dim in the hazy English air, Hindhead and Selborne invited the eye into a blue romantic distance. But it was not alone the distance that had attracted the savage to his lighthouse, the near was as seductive as the far. The woods, the open stretches of heather and yellow gorse, the clumps of scotch firs, the shining ponds with their overhanging birch trees, their water lilies, their beds of rushes. These were beautiful, and to an eye accustomed to the aridities of the American desert, astonishing. And then the solitude. Whole days passed, during which he never saw a human being. The lighthouse was only a quarter of an hour's flight from the Charing Tea Tower, but the hills of Malpais were hardly more deserted than this Surrey Heath. The crowds that daily left London left it only to play electromagnetic golf or tennis. Puttenham possessed no links. The nearest Riemann surfaces were at Guildford. Flowers and a landscape were the only attractions here, and so, as there was no good reason for coming, nobody came. During the first days, the savage lived alone and undisturbed. Of the money which, on his first arrival, John had received for his personal expenses, most had been spent on his equipment. Before leaving London, he had bought four viscose woolen blankets, rope and string, nails, glue, a few tools, matches, though he intended in due course to make a fire drill, some pots and pans, two dozen packets of seeds, and ten kilograms of wheat flour. No, not synthetic starch and cotton waste flour substitute, he had insisted, even though it is more nourishing. But when it came to pan-glandular biscuits and vitaminized beef surrogate, he had not been able to resist the shopman's persuasion. Looking at the tins now, he bitterly reproached himself for his weakness. Loathsome, civilized stuff. He had made up his mind that he would never eat it, even if he were starving. That'll teach them, he thought vindictively. It would also teach him. He counted his money. The little that remained would be enough, he hoped, to tide him over the winter. By next spring, his garden would be producing enough to make him independent of the outside world. Meanwhile, there would always be game. He had seen plenty of rabbits, and there were waterfowl on the ponds. He set to work at once to make a bow and arrows. There were ash trees near the lighthouse, and for arrow shafts, a whole copse full of beautifully straight hazel saplings. He began by felling a young ash, cut out six feet of unbranched stem, stripped off the bark and paring by paring shaved away the white wood as old Mitsuma had taught him until he had a stave of his own height, stiff at the thickened center, lively and quick at the slender tips. The work gave him an intense pleasure. After those weeks of idleness in London with nothing to do whenever he wanted anything but to press a switch or turn a handle, it was pure delight to be doing something that demanded skill and patience. He had almost finished whittling the stave into shape when he realized with a start that he was singing. Singing. It was as though, stumbling upon himself from the outside, he had suddenly caught himself out, taken himself flagrantly at fault. Guiltily he blushed. After all, it was not to sing and enjoy himself that he had come here. 
It was to escape further contamination by the filth of civilized life. It was to be purified and made good. It was actively to make amends. He realized to his dismay that absorbed in the whittling of his bow, he had forgotten what he had sworn to himself he would constantly remember. Poor Linda, and his own murderous unkindness to her and those loathsome twins, swarming like lice across the mystery of her death, insulting with their presence not merely his own grief and repentance, but the very gods themselves. He had sworn to remember. He had sworn unceasingly to make amends. And here was he, sitting happily over his bow stave, singing, actually singing. He went indoors, opened the box of mustard, and put some water to boil on the fire. Half an hour later, three Delta Minus land workers from one of the Putnam Bokanovsky groups happened to be driving to Elstead, and at the top of the hill were astonished to see a young man standing outside the abandoned lighthouse stripped to the waist and hitting himself with a whip of knotted cords. His back was horizontally streaked with crimson, and from wheel to wheel ran thin trickles of blood. The driver of the lorry pulled up at the side of the road and with his two companions stared open-mouthed at the extraordinary spectacle. One, two, three, they counted the strokes. After the eight, the young man interrupted his self-punishment to run to the wood's edge and there be violently sick. When he had finished, he picked up the whip and began hitting himself again. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ford, whispered the driver, and his twins were of the same opinion. Forty, they said. Three days later, like turkey buzzards settling on a corpse, the reporters came. Dried and hardened over a slow fire of green wood, the bow was ready. The savage was busy on his arrows. Thirty hazel sticks had been whittled and dried, tipped with sharp nails, carefully knocked. He had made a raid one night on the Putnam poultry farm and now had feathers enough to equip a whole armory. It was at work upon the feathering of his shafts that the first of the reporters found him. Noiseless on his pneumatic shoes, the man came up behind him. Good morning, Mr. Savage, he said. I am the representative of the hourly radio. Startled as though by the bite of a snake, the savage sprang to his feet, scattering arrows, feathers, glue pot, and brush in all directions. I beg your pardon, said the reporter with genuine compunction. I had no intention. He touched his hat, the aluminium stovepipe hat in which he carried his wireless receiver and transmitter. Excuse my not taking it off, he said. It's a bit heavy. Well, as I was saying, I am the representative of the hourly. What do you want? asked the savage, scowling. The reporter returned his most ingratiating smile. Well, of course, our readers would be profoundly interested. He put his head on one side. His smile became almost coquettish. Just a few words from you, Mr. Savage. And rapidly, with a series of ritual gestures, he uncoiled two wires connected to the portable battery buckled round his waist, plugged them simultaneously into the sides of his aluminium hat, touched a spring on the crown, and antennae shot up into the air, touched another spring on the peak of the brim, and like a jack-in-the-box, out jumped a microphone and hung there, quivering six inches in front of his nose, pulled down a pair of receivers over his ears, pressed a switch on the left side of the hat, and from within came a faint, waspy buzzing, turned a knob on the right, and the buzzing was interrupted by a stethoscopic wheeze and crackle by hiccoughs and sudden squeaks. Hello, he said to the microphone. Hello, hello. A bell suddenly rang inside his hat. Is that you, Edsel? Primo Mellon speaking. Yes, I've got hold of him. Mr. Savage will now take the microphone and say a few words, won't you, Mr. Savage? He looked up at the Savage with another of those winning smiles of his. Just tell our readers why you came here. What made you leave London? Hold on, Edsel. So very suddenly. And of course that whip. The savage started. How did they know about the whip? We're all crazy to know about the whip. And then something about civilization. You know the sort of stuff. What I think of the civilized girl. Just a few words, a very few. The savage obeyed with a disconcerting literalness. Five words he uttered and no more. Five words the same as those he had said to Bernard about the arch community songster of Canterbury. Honey, sons e so say na. And seizing the reporter by the shoulder, he spun him round. The young man revealed himself invitingly well covered, aimed and with all the force and accuracy of a champion foot and mouth baller, delivered a most prodigious kick. Eight minutes later, a new edition of the hourly radio was on sale in the streets of London. Hourly radio reporter has coccyx kicked by Mystery Savage, ran the headlines on the front page. Sensation in Surrey, 
Sensation even in London, thought the reporter, when on his return he read the words, and a very painful sensation, what was more. He sat down gingerly to his luncheon. Undeterred by that cautionary bruise on their colleague's coccyx, four other reporters representing the New York Times, the Frankfurt Four-Dimensional Continuum, the Fortean Science Monitor, and the Delta Mirror called that afternoon at the lighthouse and met with receptions of progressively increasing violence. From a safe distance and still rubbing his buttocks, "'Benighted fool!' shouted the man from the Fortean Science Monitor. "'Why don't you take Soma? Get away!' the savage shook his fist. The other retreated a few steps, then turned round again. "'Evil's an unreality if you take a couple of grams.' "'Kohakwa iyath tokyai. the tone was menacingly derisive. "'Pain's a delusion.' "'Oh, is it?' said the savage, and picking up a thick hazel switch, strode forward. The man from the Fortean Science Monitor made a dash for his helicopter. After that, the savage was left for a time in peace. A few helicopters came and hovered inquisitively round the tower. He shot an arrow into the importunately nearest of them. It pierced the aluminium floor of the cabin. There was a shrill yell, and the machine went rocketing up into the air with all the acceleration that its supercharger could give it. The others, in future, kept their distance respectfully. Ignoring their tiresome humming, he likened himself in his imagination to one of the suitors of the Maiden of Matsaki, unmoved and persistent among the winged vermin. The savage dug at what was to be his garden. After a time, the vermin evidently became bored and flew away. For hours at a stretch, the sky above his head was empty, and but for the larks, silent. The weather was breathlessly hot, there was thunder in the air. He had dug all the morning and was resting, stretched out along the floor. And suddenly the thought of Lenina was a real presence, naked and tangible, saying, Sweet, and put your arms round me, in shoes and socks perfumed. Impudent strumpet, but oh, oh, her arms round his neck, the lifting of her breasts, her mouth. Eternity was in our lips and eyes. Lenina, no, 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 no. He sprang to his feet and, half naked as he was, ran out of the house. At the edge of the heath stood a clump of hoary juniper bushes. He flung himself against them. He embraced not the smooth body of his desires, but an armful of green spikes. Sharp, with a thousand points, they pricked him. He tried to think of poor Linda, breathless and dumb, with her clutching hands and the unutterable terror in her eyes. Poor Linda, whom he had sworn to remember, but it was still the presence of Lenina that haunted him. Lenina, whom he had promised to forget. Even through the stab and sting of the juniper needles, his wincing flesh was aware of her, unescapably real. Sweet, sweet, and if you wanted me too, why didn't you? The whip was hanging on a nail by the door, ready to hand against the arrival of reporters. In a frenzy, the savage ran back to the house, seized it, whirled it. The knotted cords bit into his flesh. Strumpet, strumpet, he shouted at every blow as though it were Lenina, and how frantically, without knowing it, he wished it were. White, warm, scented, infamous Lenina that he was flogging thus. Strumpet, and then in a voice of despair, Oh, Linda, forgive me, forgive me, God, I'm bad, I'm wicked, I'm... No, no, you strumpet, you strumpet. From his carefully constructed hide in the wood, 300 meters away, Darwin Bonaparte, the Feely Corporation's most expert big-game photographer, had watched the whole proceedings. Patience and skill had been rewarded. He had spent three days sitting inside the bowl of an artificial oak tree, three nights crawling on his belly through the heather, hiding microphones in gorse bushes, burying wires in the soft gray sand. Seventy-two hours of profound discomfort. But now the great moment had come, the greatest Darwin Bonaparte had time to reflect as he moved among his instruments, the greatest since his taking of the famous all-howling stereoscopic feely of the gorilla's wedding. Splendid, he said to himself as the savage started his astonishing performance. Splendid. He kept his telescopic cameras carefully aimed, glued to their moving objective, clapped on a higher power to get a close-up of the frantic and distorted face, admirable, switched over for half a minute to slow motion and exquisitely comical effect, he promised himself, listened in, meanwhile, to the blows, the groans, the wild and raving words that were being recorded on the soundtrack at the edge of his film, tried the effect of a little amplification, yes, that was decidedly better, was delighted to hear in a momentary lull the shrill singing of a lark, Wished the savage would turn round so that he could get a good close-up of the blood on his back. And almost instantly, what astonishing luck, the accommodating fellow did turn round and he was able to take a perfect close-up.
Well, that was grand, he said to himself when it was all over. Really grand, he mopped his face. When they had put in the feely effects at the studio, it would be a wonderful film. Almost as good, thought Darwin Bonaparte, as the sperm whale's love life. And that by Ford was saying a good deal. Twelve days later, the Savage of Surrey had been released and could be seen, heard, and felt in every first-class feely palace in Western Europe. The effect of Darwin Bonaparte's film was immediate and enormous. On the afternoon which followed the evening of its release, John's rustic solitude was suddenly broken by the arrival overhead of a great swarm of helicopters. He was digging in his garden, digging too in his own mind, laboriously turning up the substance of his thought. Death, and he drove in his spade once and again and yet again, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. A convincing thunder rumbled through the words. He lifted another spade full of earth. Why had Linda died? Why had she been allowed to become gradually less than human? And at last, he shuddered. A good kissing carrion. He planted his foot on his spade and stamped it fiercely into the tough ground. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. Thunder again. Words that proclaim themselves true. Truer somehow than truth itself. And yet that same Gloucester had called them ever gentle gods. Besides, thy best of rest is sleep and that thou oft provokest, yet grossly fierce thy death, which is no more, no more than sleep, sleep, perchance to dream. His spade struck against a stone, he stooped to pick it up, for in that sleep of death what dreams? A humming overhead had become a roar, and suddenly he was in shadow, there was something between the sun and him. He looked up, startled from his digging, from his thoughts, looked up in a dazzled bewilderment, his mind still wandering in that other world of truer than truth still focused on the immensities of death and deity, looked up and saw, close above him, the swarm of hovering machines. Like locusts they came, hung poised, descended all around him on the heather. And from out of the bellies of these giant grasshoppers stepped men in white viscose flannels, women, for the weather was hot, in acetate shantung pajamas or velveteen shorts and sleeveless half-unzippered singlets, one couple from each. In a few minutes, there were dozens of them, standing in a wide circle round the lighthouse, staring, laughing, clicking their cameras, throwing as to an ape peanuts, packets of sex hormone chewing gum, pan glandular petit burrs. And every moment, for across the hog's back, the stream of traffic now flowed unceasingly. Their numbers increased. As in a nightmare, the dozens became scores, the scores hundreds. The savage had retreated towards cover, and now, in the posture of an animal at bay, stood with his back to the wall of the lighthouse, staring from face to face in speechless horror, like a man out of his senses. From this stupor he was aroused to a more immediate sense of reality by the impact on his cheek of a well-aimed packet of chewing gum. A shock of startling pain, and he was brought awake, awake and fiercely angry. "'Go away!' he shouted. The ape had spoken. There was a burst of laughter and hand-clapping. Good old savage, hurrah, hurrah! And through the babble he heard cries of, Whip, whip, the whip! Acting on the word's suggestion, he seized the bunch of knotted cords from its nail behind the door and shook it at his tormentors. There was a yell of ironical applause. Menacingly he advanced towards them. A woman cried out in fear. The line wavered at its most immediately threatened point, then stiffened again, stood firm. The consciousness of being an overwhelming force had given these sightseers a courage which the savage had not expected of them. Taken aback, he halted and looked round. Why don't you leave me alone? There was an almost plaintive note in his anger. Have a few magnesium salted almonds, said the man who, if the savage were to advance, would be the first to be attacked. He held out a packet. They're really very good, you know, he added with a rather nervous smile of propitiation and the magnesium salts will help to keep you young. The savage ignored his offer. What do you want with me, he asked, turning from one grinning face to another. What do you want with me? The whip, answered a hundred voices confusedly. Do the whipping stunt, let's see the whipping stunt. Then in unison and on a slow, heavy rhythm, we want the whip, shouted a group at the end of the line. We want the whip. Others at once took up the cry and the phrase was repeated parrot fashion again and again with an ever-growing volume of sound until by the seventh or eighth reiteration no other word was being spoken. We want the whip. They were all crying together. 
and intoxicated by the noise, the unanimity, the sense of rhythmical atonement, they might, it seemed, have gone on for hours, almost indefinitely. But at about the twenty-fifth repetition, the proceedings were startlingly interrupted. Yet another helicopter had arrived from across the hog's back, hung poised above the crowd, then dropped within a few yards of where the savage was standing, in the open space between the line of sightseers and the lighthouse. The roar of the air screws momentarily drowned the shouting, then as the machine touched the ground and the engines were turned off, We want the whip! We want the whip! broke out again in the same loud, insistent monotone. The door of the helicopter opened and out stepped first a fair and ruddy-faced young man, then in green velveteen shorts, white shirt and jockey cap a young woman. At the sight of the young woman the savage started, recoiled, turned pale. The young woman stood smiling at him, an uncertain, imploring, almost abject smile. The seconds passed, her lips moved, she was saying something, but the sound of her voice was covered by the loud, reiterated refrain of the sightseers, We want the whip! We want the whip! The young woman pressed both hands to her left side, and on that peach-bright, dull, beautiful face of hers appeared a strangely incongruous expression of yearning distress. Her blue eyes seemed to grow larger, brighter, and suddenly two tears rolled down her cheeks. Inaudibly, she spoke again. Then, with a quick, impassioned gesture, stretched out her arms towards the savage, stepped forward. We want the whip, we want... And all of a sudden they had what they wanted. Strumpet! The savage had rushed at her like a madman. Fitch you! Like a madman he was slashing at her with his whip of small cords. Terrified she had turned to flee, had tripped and fallen in the heather. Henry, Henry, she shouted. But her ruddy-faced companion had bolted out of harm's way behind the helicopter. With a whoop of delighted excitement the line broke. There was a convergent stampede towards that magnetic center of attraction. Pain was a fascinating horror. Fry, lechery, fry, frenzied, the savage slashed again. Hungrily they gathered round, pushing and scrambling like swine about the trough. Oh, the flesh, the savage ground his teeth. This time it was on his shoulders that the whip descended. Kill it, kill it. Drawn by the fascination of the horror of pain and from within impelled by that habit of cooperation, that desire for unanimity and atonement, which their conditioning had so ineradicably implanted in them, they began to mime the frenzy of his gestures, striking at one another as the savage struck at his own rebellious flesh, or at that plump incarnation of turpitude writhing in the heather at his feet. Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! The savage went on shouting. Then suddenly somebody started singing Orgy Porgy, and in a moment they had all caught up the refrain and singing had begun to dance. Orgy Porgy, round and round and round, beating one another in six-eight time. Orgy Porgy. It was after midnight when the last of the helicopters took its flight. Stupefied by Soma and exhausted by a long-drawn frenzy of sensuality, the savage lay sleeping in the heather. The sun was already high when he awoke. He lay for a moment, blinking in owlish incomprehension at the light, then suddenly remembered everything. Oh my God, my God, he covered his eyes with his hand. That evening the swarm of helicopters that came buzzing across the hog's back was a dark cloud ten kilometers long. The description of last night's orgy of atonement had been in all the papers. Savage, called the first arrivals as they alighted from their machine. Mr. Savage. There was no answer. The door of the lighthouse was ajar. They pushed it open and walked into a shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room they could see the bottom of the staircase that led up to the higher floors. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. Mr. Savage, slowly, very slowly, like two unhurried compass needles, the feet turned towards the right, north, northeast, east, southeast, south, south, southwest then paused, and after a few seconds turned as unhurriedly back towards the left. South-southwest, south-southeast-east, 